So up next, we have Patrick Soon Xiong. He is a transplant surgeon, businessman, bioscientist, and media executive. He's also the inventor of the drug Abraxane, hopefully I got that right, known for its efficacy against lung, breast, and pancreatic cancer, and also the founder of Nantworks, a network of health and technology startups. And today he will be speaking regarding introducing quantum oncotherapeutics, the path to memory T cells. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you for having me. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, go ahead. You're, okay. you're good. Okay, good. Well, thank you for having me. So today I really want to introduce this concept that we've shared with some of my colleagues over the last seven to 10 years. So if I go to the next slide, the concept of um, introducing uh, oncotherapeutics from concept to, to um, validation. And from the concept perspective, this um, symposium is perfect in the sense that we need to look at the evolutionary co consequences actually of our standard of care. So one of the things that we've been pushing is really we need to treat the host rather than the disease. And this cancer, like a virus, is an intelligent machine in the sense that it adapts to the host. But I think worse, it adapts to our standard of care. And then sadly, our standard of care have been rather empiric, and I believe has induced uh, to what we call tolerogenic cell death. I think the biggest, um, and the last talk will highlight that highlights that the biggest issue is a recognition in the next slide, is that we induce um, uh, heterogenic cells and that cancer is in fact a multiclonal disease, which puts us in a very, very difficult position. So next slide, because it's in a sense, a whack-a-mole. And as you could see from, it's taken nine years to develop this targeted therapy in nine weeks up to a response for the tumor to relapse. So I think the next two slides speaks very specifically to this is in fact, we have this illusion and that of clonal dominance and there's an inevitable acquisition of resistance. <clears throat> and um, that sadly, the, the feeling is that resistance is therefore fait accompli and it's merely the interval required. So we developed this um, protocol called Itomics. And in a revolutionary trial, um, um, a biopsy the patients day four, day seven, day 125, throughout the course of their treatment. And as you could see from this genomic plots, um, the mutation occurs in, in relationship to the treatment. Next slide, please. So I think uh, if we accept the concept that our consequences of standard of care induces what we call tolerogenic cell death, what happens as a consequence of um, uh, inducing the suppressors, next slide, is in fact, we actually obliterate what I call the triangle of offense, which is the natural killer cell, the dendritic cell, the T cells. And in so doing, next slide, um, induce this cascade of autophagy, uh, EMT, um, loss of MHC1, micrometastasis, cancer stem cell, and call this incurable and therefore cell, and, and therefore death. We have to change this paradigm, next slide. So over the course of the last, uh, 10 years of my career, since we developed a Braxane, um, that we, we rose this concept of quantum oncotherapeutics to really change the paradigm of cancer care. And this concept of, 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 um, of quantum oncotherapeutics is to induce immunogenic cell death. So let me take you through the concept. And um, I apologize for these complex slides, but if you see in the top there, you see first line, second line, third line death, which is what um, the, the standard of care is. And so therefore, if we obliterate the standard of care and now think about evolutionary, that our treatment should be based on the host rather than the disease. So one of the first things that the cancer cell does is it finds its way to hide through lack of expression or lack of presentation. <clears throat> and therefore, by inducing DAMPs or PAMPs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, we can expose the targets necessary. Next slide. The next step uh, within this um, 
of quantum change is um, to kill. And therefore, this is the um, natural killer cell that we've been imbued with since the Cambrian age in order for mammalians to actually survive uh, any transformed cell. Next slide. And this then uh, uh, goes from the innate immunity system to the adaptive immune system, in which the learned or informed method activated the dendritic cell. Next slide. So that the memory killer T cell and memory NK cell could be exercised. If we recognize that these are the um, four opportunities available to us, next slide, we can then overcome um, these issues of heterogeneity and then convert that from tolerogenic cell death uh, to immunogenic cell death. So let me take you through that path um, as we've been doing this. So from this concept to exploratory trials, and, and the only way that we could prove that this concept um, is viable is to take a very ambitious, what we started as Cancer Moonshot 2020, attempt at multiple tumor types and explore this uh, quantum from expose, um, um, inform, activate, uh, kill, and remember as a path in a quantum way. So let me take you through uh, our attempts, firstly with regard to inducing damps. And this uh, symposium obviously doesn't give me the time to speak to damps, but uh, damage-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs are our only innate mechanism to protect ourselves in the normal physiological state. And uh, these, what we've now discovered, chemomodulators and the drug I developed called nampaclitaxel or Braxane, was one of the first uh, damp inducers to enter the tumor microenvironment. Next slide. And what was exciting is we discovered that this nampaclitaxel, through this concept of macropanocytosis and GP60 and calveolin 1, induced M2 macrophages to M1s. So we had the first beginnings of uh, the induction of damps. Next slide. Which then said, the opportunity now would, would be able to take this, and this since 2014, when what we decided to do to go away for six years, which is now 2020, and explore this hypothesis that if we penetrate the tumor microenvironment, we can actually modulate the tumor microenvironment itself. But just sending a signal or exposing the tumor is not sufficient. We now needed to activate the immune system. Next slide. And the immune system uh, in the tumor microenvironment, next slide, is the natural killer cell. So as I said, the natural killer cell uh, was developed since the Cambrian age. Next slide. And in um, 1909, it was Paul Ehrlich who recognized that tumors occur at high frequency as a normal physiological event. So if that were the case, um, the only protective mechanism we had was our innate system, which was the natural killer cells who would recognize um, MHC non-self. In 1990, um, next slide, I published this first paper of mine recognizing that natural killer cells in pancreatic cancer, as well as pancreas transplant, um, was the basis for either rejecting the tumor or killing the cancer. And this began the quest of mine to, to, con to conceive of this concept of quantum uh, therapeutics. In 1992, next slide, a natural killer cell line of a patient with a natural killer cell tumor was discovered. It was tantamount to having a healer cell line. And I believe this uh, was then the universal um, opportunity to take a universal natural killer cell completely off the shelf engineer this natural killer cell, which has full activating receptors, no inhibitory receptors, and then develop truly a product that one could universally administer to target and kill the tumors. Thus began the beginning of um, the path to onco, uh, quantum oncotherapeutics. Next slide. Over the last four years, um, we've evolved this natural killer cell, which we called ANC, 
into a high affinity CD16, a natural killer cell, so that it could impart ADCC. We've then created a targeted natural killer cell using PDL1 as the target, um, EGFR, HER2, PSMA, and, and the pipeline. It was important for us to develop this natural killer cell as a product rather than a process. So we've spent the last four years developing manufacturing facilities, fully GMP. We've now manufactured trillions of these cells, injected trillions of these cells, and have been uh, sh shown we can administer these cells from a cryopreserved and at point of care thaw and hang the bag as an outpatient. So this was an exciting moment for us because we now had one of the tools to uh, imbue the pathway of uh, quantum oncotherapeutics. Next slide. This led us then to the concept of how do we activate the dendritic cell? And the dendritic cell activation opportunity was, as we're now learning from COVID, and ironically, just yesterday, we received FDA approval uh, to uh, utilize this exact same next generation adenovirus uh, to inform um, the body. And this was the beginning now of what we call the NAND cancer vaccine as part of the uh, quantum oncotherapeutics. This adenovirus is second generation, meaning it's E2, it's, it has four deletions, which allows it to be immunologically stealth and therefore to be given repeatedly in the face of adenoviral immunity. And in so doing, we took CEA, Mach 1, Brachyuri, and worked with the National Cancer Institute. And I'm pleased to say, next slide, not only in infectious diseases on the left-hand side of the slide, as you could see, we developed this for H1N1, loss of fever, HIV, but on the right-hand side for CEA, neoepitopes, and multiple um, advanced tumors, and I'll refer you to these papers, where we've now clinically shown in over 125 patients at 13 phase one, two trials, that this adenovirus not only can be given safely, but we can predict the new epitope to inform. So we now have the tools to inform the dendritic cells. Next slide. Which then leaves you to the memory T cell. How would we induce the memory T cell? And here is what we call the super molecule IL-15. So this IL-15 molecule, which sees the beta gamma receptor, uh, both on the NK cells and T cells, but by putting an FC receptor, it also sees the macrophages. So here is the triangle offense in its full glory, where we would have a uh, IL-15 activating the uh, NK cells, T cells, and M1 macrophages uh, without uh, 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 upregulating the T regulatory cells or the suppressor cells. Next slide. So that was the concept. And how would we go then from this concept with all these tools of DAMS, natural killer cells, dendritic cells, memory T cells, to exploratory trials, and thus began QUILT. So the idea would be uh, we went to the FDA in March 2017 as a consequence of announcing the Cancer Moonshot 2020. And the ambitious goal was to attempt this concept of quantum oncotherapeutics across multiple tumor types and not just to um, uh, explore them, but validate them through uh, randomized trials after confirmation of exploration. However, as could be seen, in order for us to explore this, we needed to explore these in patients with third line and fourth line and fifth line cancers, uh, because we were uh, activating not just um, single agents, but not just two novel agents, not just three novel agents, not just five novel agents, but up to 11 novel agents. And to show that we can give these agents uh, so that we can do uh, DAMPS, um, um, adenovirus, natural killer cells, IL-15, um, um, aldoxorubicin, all in a pathway, and next slide, so that we can institute, next slide, this, this complex crosstalk. So obviously time does not permit me to go through this very complex crosstalk, but this crosstalk required a temporospatial um, knowledge of the host. It required uh, us modulating the patient's um, activity or it's what we call immunoscore of the 23 uh, immune cells to the treatment that we are giving. It also required um, a very careful sequencing 
Next slide. So this complicated path, um, um, and I would like you sort of maybe just to absorb this particular slide, was this ambitious trial of exploration across multiple tumor types so that we could explore the validity of this hypothesis. Uh, is this hypothesis correct that uh, quantum oncotherapeutics would change the uh, paradigm of care? Unfortunately, we were given um, this opportunity to put this into patients with third line, fourth line, fifth line uh, cancer which failed all stands of care and whose bodies had been ravaged already by high dose chemotherapy, whose bone marrows uh, were already immunosuppressed or, and, and suffered multiple doses of radiation. Nonetheless, we took on this challenge and I'm now going to give you some data regarding this challenge. Next slide. So from concept to um, challenging to, to this hypothesis. This is the slide I presented to the FDA in, in 2017. And I'm forever grateful to Dr. Pazda and Sean Cozen and the team who allowed uh, me to present this to multiple leadership teams in a two to three hour session at the FDA to propose this hypothesis that high dose molecular uninformed chemotherapy destroys the immune system, that natural killer cells is the core to the innate system, that checkpoint therapies alone are insufficient, that, immunos that we need to uh, address the immunosuppressive tumor in my environment, and that the innate and adaptive system, if we uh, orchestrate that to induce what I call immunogenic cell death, could, and this is what I meant, then at that point, 2007, could generate long-term durable responses. That's another word for saying complete remission. That's another word for saying complete responses without um, affecting the patient's quality of life in an outpatient setting. So let me now share with you uh, our results. In bladder cancer, we induced DAMPS and the natural killer cells, and these are the two trials, and both in cis uh, patients. And as you can see, BCG has been the standard of care for, I don't know, 40 years, um, but BCG unresponsive patients require the, a complete cystectomy, which is nine to 10% or mortality rate. What was discovered very early on that the BCG activates through PAMPs, natural killer cells, which is the innate system. So therefore, if we could enhance both natural killer cells and memory T cells through our IL-15, which is now called Hangtiba, uh, would we change that paradigm? Next slide. And in our phase one dose finding study, what was remarkable, a uh, hundred percent complete remission lasting over 24 months. And this is fresh data as we speak today in our um, pivotal trial in which we now have 74% complete remission in 50 patients. Um, and we, if you look at this comparison to the standard of care of either BCG alone or drugs such as Valrubicin and Pembro, it far exceeds that in a, a very uh, safe way in which uh, quantum oncotherapeutics was um, instituted. Next slide. If you take this to Merkel cell carcinoma, again, we instituted this uh, where we now added the natural killer cell, off-the-shelf natural killer cell. And I'm happy to say our very first uh, attempt with a natural killer cell using just this uh, first generation natural killer cell we now have a patient going five years, uh, close to five years, completely off treatment for the last year. That uh, was fifth line um, Merkel cell. It failed everything before it came to see us. And again, another example, and this is now entering into a, a pivotal trial with um, adding uh, um, this therapy. Next slide. Now taking to non-small cell lung cancer, and similarly, uh, we then proceeded again now to say checkpoint therapy uh, was a T-cell therapy, but what if you activated patients who had failed checkpoint therapy, and what we discovered in this published in Lancet, that when you gave patients who had progressed or relapsed with checkpoint therapy, the checkpoint therapy plus the IL-15 super agonist, we had remarkable disease control and duration of control in the next slide. 
who shows that in the spider plot, where these are the, the starting point are patients who are on checkpoint therapy, progressed, and then given the same checkpoint therapy, and you see this remarkable duration, and these are about 81 patients in lung cancer. Next slide. And this then has now led us to the validation process in which now that we are informed, we have now randomized 812 patient study ongoing comparing standard of care to on, uh, quantum oncotherapeutics. Next slide. Both in uh, chemo-free and chemotherapy-free, and here are uh, 726 patient study. The So next slide, please. Pancreatic cancer, same story. Next slide. We did exploratory trials across multiple uh, stages of pancreatic cancer, went all the way through to added all the molecules. And next slide was very gratified, finally developed a complete remission in a patient with second line pancreatic cancer now lasting over 10 months. Next slide. This has now led us, next slide, into three trials, first line, next slide, second line, and third line, pancreatic cancer, um, randomized trials in which we will now validate the story. Next slide. Triple negative breast cancer, same results. Next slide. We now have a complete remission, disease control of a complete remission of 22% in third line pancreatic uh, triple negative breast cancer. Next slide. Similarly with head and neck cancer, complete remission uh, with fourth and fifth line head and neck cancer. Next slide. And I'm running out of time. So, so in summary, we've taken this, uh, what we started and embarked on in 2017, um, this attempt to launch a very complex study of what we call now quantum oncotherapeutics. Next slide. And um, we believe we've demonstrated the hypothesis in multiple tumor types. And we believe we are now on the path to validation with randomized trials. Um, thank you for your time. So Patrick, thank you. I've got several questions from the audience. Um, Ann Barker says, Patrick, if the innate immune system is our best defense against cancer, what immune strategy will be most effective in a prevention setting? Yeah, and I think one of the opportunities to be using is actually exploring our IL-15 super agonist, which activates both the uh, innate as well as the T cells. I think the combination of adaptive and T cell memory as well as T cell diversity. So we're working with uh, Jeffrey Schloem both in colon cancer and, and prostate cancer, where the combination, uh, where the opportunity to give a subcutaneous dosing of um, patients with high risk cancer opportunity like polyposis coli. Um, and this is something we excitedly exploring. So it's both the innate and the adaptive and the super agonist IL-15 has that opportunity to activate both. Dennis Noble asks, is the use of quantum intended to indicate that low dosage is used? Usually understanding of quantum is discrete size packaging as in quantum mechanics and quantal synaptic vesicles. Would it not be clearer to patients to say low dose? Is this just a question of nomenclature? No, it's not just low dose. It is low dose. Low dose is a portion of the quantum, but it's also temporal spatial because it's the timing, the sequence, and the adaption, adaption of your therapy to the adaptive process that the host demonstrates. So the quantum change that happens is affected not just by the cancer itself, but what we're doing to the patient. Ann Barker asks, as you know, many countries administer BCG to newborns. Would the US population benefit from BCG vaccination? We have data on the incidence of COVID-19 in bladder cancer patients post-BCG. That's an interesting question. 
No, there's some evidence that there's truly antigen cascade, uh, meaning cross cross reactivity, whether the specificity of BCG, which which says that then you have an innate active innate system. Having said that, I think uh, we have adapted the COVID strategy to our cancer strategy, where the current COVID vaccines are mainly spike and therefore antibody dependent. We have actually now just launched and announced yesterday where we're looking at the nucleocapsid as well as spike so that we have a T-cell centric as well as innate, as well as a B-cell, as well as an antibody um, vaccine. And I'm really hopeful um, based on that approach. We've done a non-human primate uh, challenge study with Bader as part of the Operation Warp Speed and I'm anxiously waiting that data and that data will be out literally within weeks. So with our phase one and our um, body data, I think adapting our cancer approach to COVID is a really exciting approach. Um, Doru Paul asks, what is the status of your project now? Do you move to phase two and phase three trials in these tumors? Yes, we in fact are active in phase, randomized phase three trial for first line pancreatic cancer versus standard of care, second line pancreatic cancer versus standard of care, third line pancreatic cancer. And we actively are recruiting patients in first and second, first line lung cancer in a randomized trial and similarly for triple negative breast cancer. So I think now that we've completed our exploration in all these multiple tumor types, we will have a common treatment protocol of quantum oncotherapeutics versus current standard of care in the randomized trials. And they're all activated already and currently recruiting. That is excellent. And Dennis Noble just wanted to clarify. So Quantal characterizes the aim of the response, not the dosage? It's both. In order, the dosage is important because we've followed this empiric thing of giving high dose so we can kill the cancer cell. Actually, what we're doing, we're killing our natural killer cells. We're killing our T cells. So, <laughs> metro <laughs> exactly. So, metronomically, that is important. But just doing damps and pumps and exposing the tumor is, is insufficient to drive memory. So, we need to inform the dendritic cell, MHC1, MHC2, activate the natural killer cell, and activate the T cell, and activate the B cell. That is all temporal spatial, it's a systems approach. And that's what I try to name this thing, quantum oncotherapeutics. Another win for systems biology. <laughs> Thank well, you very much. Thank you for having me.